we're going to do for time there. So uh, short programming note, um, we're going to wrap up a little bit early this evening uh, because uh, a couple of the people who are on our worship team this week have a very limited window of rehearsal time available. Like they have to go to work tonight after they're done here. And so um, worship is going to have just a very, very short window. So we're going to give them a little bit of extra time uh, by wrapping up just a few minutes early. So uh, I believe that's... Uh, Let's see, what else is going on? Men's got a barbecue cookout. I lost the word. How did I lose the word for that? Cookout here at the church building on Saturday starts at 5. All right, so hamburgers, hot dogs, chips, brats, fire, men. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll have a good time with that. Uh, come bring your friends, bring your family. Um, and we'll, we'll enjoy that time together. Um, ladies, Bible study tomorrow at 1? One. 1, yep. Seems like I'm forgetting something else that I'm supposed to mention. Maybe it will come to me and maybe it won't. I don't know. Uh, but as we get started, let's, uh, let's go to God in a word of prayer and then we will dive in for the evening. Father God, we just uh, thank you for the rain that you've sent our way. Father, we thank you for the cooler weather, and we just ask that you would uh, continue to uh, uh, pour out your blessings on this land. Father, uh, as we uh, seek to be your people in this world, as we seek to live in light of the gospel and our relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray that you would open our eyes, help us to see this world as you see it, help us to recognize our role in different situations, and Father, in all things, may we... Uh, may we hold up our love of you and our love of our neighbor as ourself. Guide our studies tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, this is weird for me. I don't usually use this. However, I'm dealing with shoulder stuff that like just holding the Bible the whole time is bothering me. So I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying. Um, so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians. And if you notice, I kind of titled this uh, study a gospel-shaped life. That's because Paul is going to um, kind of stomp on all of our toes in all areas of our life and going to remind us, hey, hey, you've made a commitment. You're looking forward to something in the future, the hope of Jesus' return, the hope of resurrection, and these things should shape everything that you do. And so what Paul does is he starts going through um, a letter, like uh, it's almost like he's replying to a letter or he's gotten a report from somebody and he's kind of answering some things. So what we have in 1 Corinthians is a letter and it is a letter from Paul to the church in Corinth. Corinth. Very good. Anybody know what, anything about Corinth? Paul wrote, a letter to Paul wrote at least two, three, four, probably, if not more, um, the, the joke I've, I've said for a long time is we don't really have 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We probably have something like 2nd and 4th Corinthians. Uh, when you kind of read between the lines, you start seeing other communications mentioned that we don't have. Um, there, there's stuff in 2nd Corinthians especially that Paul's like, yeah, in, in my letter to you, in my last letter to you, and it's like, it's not in there. So there must have been something else that was going back and forth. Um, Corinth is an important Gentile city. It's a port city. What do you know about port cities? Melting pot. Melting pot, right? You're going to have a lot of people that are there that have kind of come from everywhere. And so, you know, you might not be from Corinth, but you might move there because you work for the shipping company that's going to be moving ships back and forth. And so it's your job. You're going to be spending a lot of time there. You just move there. And so you bring your culture, your ideals, your thoughts with you. Yeah, your religion. Corinth, sorry, Yes, there were tons of temples there. There was one to Zeus, there was one to Apollo, there was one um, emperor worship was a thing there at one point. Um, Diana and, okay, so Artemis and Diana. Um, for those of you who don't know, Rome kind of Romanized the Greek gods. And so you would have gods that descriptions were very similar, they would do the similar things, it even looked similar, but they would have different names. One a Roman name, one a Greek name. And so the idea between Artemis and Diana, pretty much the same goddess. Um, 
And you, anyway, you, we could run down that rabbit trail. Did anybody teach Greek mythology, Roman mythology in school? If so, you can be our Greek or guest lecturer tonight on, or when we come across idolatry to, to fill us in on all the overlap between them. Um, so it was a very pagan city, lots of worship of other gods there. And so Paul becomes a missionary there. He shows up and he's going to plant a church there. Um, I hadn't planned on doing this, but let's do this real quick. Turn over to Acts because, of course, in 1 Corinthians, we're going to, you know, go somewhere else to start with. This is kind of how I roll. Uh, Acts chapter 18, I think. Um, yeah, 18 is in Corinth. <clears throat> All right. So Paul um, leaves Athens and goes to Corinth in chapter 18. There, uh, excuse me, of Acts 18, if you're watching online and can't read my mind. Uh, there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius, anybody know who Claudius was? Roman emperor. Claudius had ordered all Jews leave Rome. Probably more so Jewish Christians, but we'll set that aside for right now. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook his clothes in protest and said to them, you, your blood be on your own heads, I'm innocent of it. And from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack or harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching the word of God. And while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it'd be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about your words and names and your own law, I mean, y'all settle it yourselves. I will not judge between such things. So he drove them off, and then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul, and Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied with Priscilla and Aquila. So there you go. There's Paul in Corinth. Uh, he's reasoning in the synagogues. Why do you think he would reason in the synagogues? It's what he always did. Why? Why do you think so? He went to the Jews first. Let's think about practical reasons why. I, again, I know first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, but let's think practical. If you were trying to present the gospel of Jesus, why would you start with a Jewish synagogue? Larry. They would have had the background of knowledge to understand what he was talking about. Jesus is a Jew or Gentile? Jew. Right. And so he says that all Moses and the prophets and everything was setting up his coming. So the people who have been longing and looking for the Messiah for centuries and were reciting all the texts and were memorizing all the Hebrew scriptures in school, that was their job, why wouldn't you start with them? Because they know the book. And if you're going to use your Bible, why wouldn't you go with people that already have the Bible you know, pretty much memorized? And so it was already an in there. But you notice that he hits a wall. They become abusive. They will not listen to him. So Paul says, okay, I'm done. <laughs> and walks right out that door and walks in right next door and goes, here I am. <laughs> Anybody want to come? And so people were starting to come to him. They were reaching out to their, their uh, Gentile neighbors. Uh, the leader of the synagogue believed and went, okay, I'm going to come over here now. 
Well, they appoint another leader, and that guy gets beaten to a pulp because he's bringing fraudulent charges against people. And it's, a, it's kind of a chaotic story, isn't it? A lot of abuse, a lot of not getting along, a lot of problems there. Now, Paul's there for a year and a half, and then he leaves. And he takes kind of his two ministry partners with him there. Now, Paul still loves this church. He cares about this church. And so you can tell this by the correspondence that he has back and forth over the years. So as Paul um, is writing this, what he's trying to do is keep the work going in a largely Gentile church. Are there Jews in the church in Corinth? Absolutely. We're going to run into some problems where the Jewish part of the congregation sees things one way and the Gentile part sees another way. And what Paul could do is say, well, you Jewish folks, you go and meet down here. You Gentile folks, you guys go meet down here. And that way, you know, you can wave to each other on the sidewalk, but you guys can have your own separate things and not have to get along. But that's not what he does. That's never what he does. There's time after time where he could split the church apart and say, y'all meet over there, y'all meet over there, and just, my life will be easier. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he keeps promoting the fact that we are united in Christ Jesus, we are united in a hope of a resurrection in Christ. The same Spirit lives in you and me, regardless of how we grew up. Therefore, we should be loving our neighbor, and that should govern my decision-making. So, Corinth, the, the letters to the Corinthians stomp on toes a lot because we keep coming back to the point of, well, is it right to do that? And the answer is, eh, it depends. Is there anything wrong with doing that? Not a thing. Unless... <laughs> unless it causes problems. Causes problems for who? Yes. Believer and unbeliever alike. And so Paul's going to get that way with a, a lot of different topics. First uh, Corinthians is a letter, so it's going to have an introduction, it's going to have a closing. But in between that, Paul writes basically five essays. And what Paul's doing is he's responding to a a problem. He's heard a report, somebody has asked him, somebody has said, he, he knows something about the situation. And so what he does is he lays out the problem. I've, I've heard it said, or I've heard you say, or about your question, or about whatever the issue it is. He'll, he'll deal with the problem, and he'll kind of wrestle with it and try to lay out the argument from it. And then what he does is he takes that problem, and then he says, let's think about the gospel for a minute. And he brings the gospel into line, and he starts talking about, well, what does it mean to live in honoring Christ? What does it mean to love my neighbor who's also honoring Christ? What does it mean to have two different opinions on something and yet still both be committed to Christ? How do we do that? And then he'll usually take some kind of example and apply it. Sometimes it's multiple case studies. He'll say, in this case, do that, but in this case, do that. And so what we're supposed to do, since we're not living in Corinth 2,000 years ago, what our job is is to look at the principle behind what Paul is saying. Look at his rationale. Why does he want them to do X, Y, or Z? And then look at our world. We might not have the same problem. We, we might not. I mean, there is not a temple to Artemis down on the corner of 65 and 14 where, you know, temple prostitutes are there. But do we have sexual temptation in this world? No. Oh. So while it might not be seen that I'm worshiping a God if I participate in that, might I run into some other problems with that? So what is Paul after and what are we getting into? So this is just kind of a, a quick overview of it. If you've got your Bible, if you've got notes and you want to take notes on this, um, it's divided up into really to five sections with chapter 16 kind of being a greeting and a sum, summary of, of some of the themes he's got. So the first section uh, is up here on the screen. It's chapters 1 through 4, and the overwhelming theme throughout this is division. People are divided about various things. There's, there's different problems that are causing division. So chapter 1 through 4 is about division. 
And what we're going to find out pretty quickly uh, is that Paul wants us to realize that we should not be divided because we are one in Christ. We're all going to have the same resurrection. We're all going to spend eternity together. So <laughs> get to liking each other now. Um, chapters 5 through 7, it's going to be a lot of stuff about sex. Um, he's going to be dealing with all kinds of different relationships and different problems and different situations. And, you know, is it good? Is it bad? Is it otherwise? What, how do we navigate this world? And again, we think our world is oversexualized, and it is. But it's like crazy in Paul's world. Or maybe, maybe we should put it this way. Maybe in our world, a little bit more of it is kind of behind closed doors, but it was more out in the open then. Um, I'm just curious, has anybody been to Pompeii? Anybody know what Pompeii is? It's a city in Italy. Part of the Roman Empire, a volcano blew up, kind of covered the city, and pretty much just made it a time capsule. Uh, I've never been there. Uh, I have family who have, has been there. But what they tell me is that when you like, go through there, like, you'll actually still see people that died there because they have now been turned to stone by the, by the, uh, the lava that happened. And so they've, they've gone through and they've excavated. And you can just, I mean, you literally see the city as it was left. Guess what is all over Pompeii on the sidewalks and the doors, on the frames of the houses, on the walls of the buildings, like just the city decorations. Think about 4th of July around here. What's everywhere? Fireworks and flags. Guess what was all over Vesuvius? Pornographic images everywhere. Like you're just walking down the street and, my goodness, there's a gigantic penis on the ground. Okay. And that's common on every street. and every, uh, it's, just, it's just how it was. And, and so, again, it's real easy for us to try to go, okay, what we know, what we're thinking of, the world was different. There's a lot of stuff that we would go, oh, you'll never see that today. And we're shocked, but that was daily life in Paul's world. I'm glad we're shocked. I'm glad we go, oh, because Paul's neighbors were like, yeah, who cares? Now, you might start going, wow, isn't the world kind of reverting back to that? I think in a lot of ways, yeah. So chapter 5, 6, and 7, he's dealing with sex in all different kinds of forms, how it breaks down relationships, and how Christ came to restore broken relationships. So what does that mean in light of that? Uh, chapter 8 through 10, we're dealing with a whole lot of stuff around food. Food. Is food controversial? Can be. Can be. Right? Now, now, not today, because everybody knows the best barbecue comes from... Well, well never mind. I'm, I'm not going to go there, right? But we like things today, and we think about foods, and we argue about what burger chain is best, or where the best barbecue is, or, you know, who makes the best whatever. Have you ever seen food split families? Have you ever seen food break up marriages? Have you ever seen food cause riots? Lack of food cause riots? Okay. Yeah, maybe. Get, get a little hangry around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What if I'm part of a family and part of my family um, rejects me because of who I eat with or what I eat when I go eat with them? We had breakfast the other day. Well, well it's been more than the other day. It's a couple weeks ago, right? Do you remember what I ordered for breakfast? Good, I don't either. But you better be sure that in Paul's world, people be looking going, did you see what he's eating? So we look at food completely differently. P.S., we have leftovers in the kitchen. Do you know how rare that is in the history of humankind to have leftovers? Unbelievable. So the whole idea of food, even though we have it, even though we use it, even though we interact with it all the time, it hits differently. We need to be aware of those differences. Hint, Paul's going to draw it back to Jesus and the resurrection again, because it matters. 
uh, chapters 11 through 14, we're going to be talking about assemblies, gatherings, getting together, spending time together. Some of this is going to be worship. Some of this is going to be uh, other situations in households. Uh, I was having a conversation with um, somebody earlier today, and we were talking about how, how much... I don't, I don't know that I want to use the word backwards, because that has a bad connotation to it. Um, we, today, I think, in churches, we tend to put our emphasis on the wrong syllables. Uh, our emphasis on the wrong syllables, if you will. Uh, and what was paramount in the high point of Paul's church experience was probably what we would call small groups. That was the driving factor. Now, what's the big thing in church schedules in our world? Worship service. Sunday morning, right? What if Sunday morning was only the seventh in a long line of gatherings, or the tenth, or the twelfth, or the thirtieth in a long line of gatherings throughout the week? No, it matters. It's important. But if you think about worship as only being something that happens one day a week, you've completely lost Paul's train of thought. Now, Acts chapter 2 tells us that they met in the temple courts daily. So they're doing like the big worship service thing daily. But then they're also gathering together in their homes and breaking bread and singing and praying and devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings. And so what does that look like? Small group. And you're doing that over and over and over and over again, every chance you get. And then you're worshiping in the temple at the times of prayer. If you're in Jerusalem, it's nine and three every day. If you're outside of Jerusalem, what might you do? Synagogue. Synagogue meets every day. Where did you send your kids to school if you were a Jewish Christian Synagogue, that's where they, they went to church every day. That's where they learned, and they weren't studying Roman history or, you know, Latin penmanship or anything like that. Guess what they were studying? The Torah. They were learning God's Word. So everything is revolving around that. You're spending time together all the time in all the ways. Now, if it's a problem that's one hour a week where I'm having a conflict with somebody, that's bad enough, right? Right? What if I'm having that conflict now 14 to 21 times a week? And because I am a poor slave and there are wealthy people in our congregation that feed us every night, now my food and my sustenance is tied up in the conflict. Hmm. So does food matter now? Oh, yeah. Does relationships and gathering together in an appropriate way matter now? Yeah. So not don't think just Sunday morning when we're reading that. Think life. Think your family. P.S. What did the church call each other? Brother and sister. Why? Because they were they were family. Chapter 15 is all about resurrection. Here's a hint. Paul does not back down at all on resurrection. Not one bit. You don't believe in it, you don't believe in the gospel. That's not a good place to be. You can't say, I believe in Jesus and I believe in all this sort of stuff and say, oh, he didn't rise from the dead. As Paul's going to say, if you don't believe in the resurrection, then, you, then the cross makes absolutely no sense and therefore your faith is worthless. Which, P.S., he's been hinting at the resurrection all the way through this and then he gets to his last statement and goes, I'm going to hit this one out of the park. And he doesn't back down. Then chapter 16 comes around, and he talks a little bit about giving. He's kind of just trying to tie up some loose ends about life, about how to love one another. It's, it's just kind of this bow on this package of what we need to do, and then he ends it with his traditional blessing. And there's the end of 1 Corinthians. Any questions? Not that you're an expert in 1 Corinthians at this point. Neither am I, P.S. But that's kind of a 30,000-foot flyover. So as we get to each one of these sections, again, it's really easy to go, okay, I know exactly what he's talking about. Really try to put yourself back into the world of the videos that we've seen for the past several weeks. 
try to think, what is it like that I'm not going to Harder House to buy brats for the men's get-together? The only place in town that sells meat like that is that temple down the street. Because they're the only ones that have meat like that to sell. So if I have meat and I eat it, is there anything wrong with it? Is there anything wrong with it if I'm eating it in that place? Is there anything wrong with it if I know where it came from? Or if somebody prays before we eat and they pray and dedicate it to a different God? What, what do I do? And Paul's going to give us some guidance. P.S. What we're going to serve on Saturday is fine. <laughs> we're going to pray to the appropriate God over the meat. Don't let it freak you out. All right, so let's dive into 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Hmm. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So right up at the top of 1 Corinthians, we read who wrote this letter. Who wrote it? Ansosthenes. Very good. Paul and Sosthenes. Again, we always call these the epistles of Paul, and that's, that's right. They're letters written by Paul, and most of them have a co-author. Timothy's a co-author on some of them. Sosthenes is one. Again, Paul is usually working in a group. He, he often will, at least in the greeting, say, I and my friend Tertius are here, and we're, you know, we're sending you greetings, and you know, greet John Mark as he comes your way. And it, It's Paul's team. And so he's not saying, I, Paul. He's saying, I, Paul, and. Why do you think he would include another author in the letter? Okay, it could be a validity, it could be a local, right? Um, I just went blank. Colossians. Paul mentions Onesimus. And Onesimus is going to be coming their way. He's going to be involved in this somehow. They're going to run into him. So he mentions him in the letter. Here, Sosthenes may be a well-known local. But there's an Old Testament concept behind this. Why would I have more than one person pinning the letter? A matter is established on the count of two or three witnesses. And so Paul can write all day long and he can claim his apostleship and he can complain, uh, you know, uh, give his authority and all sorts of things, and he does that at times. But if you notice, when he starts talking about his rights as an apostle, he always says, we. He's putting out that unified front there, that we are doing this, that we are doing that. Paul's not the Lone Ranger. P.S., even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. He didn't do it alone either. And so Paul is there saying, look, we are bringing you this message. It's coming through divine revelation through Paul, but it's being worked out and it's being sent together in a group. Uh, and then he gives the traditional Jewish and Greek greeting. If you ever get an email from me and you're like, your email's messed up because there's really funky letters at the bottom of the email. It's Greek, it's grace and peace. Karis Kairene. I sign all my emails that way in, in code. Um, but it's the Greek, a Roman greeting, grace to you, and the Jewish greeting, shalom, peace to you. So right off the bat, when Paul's writing it this way, you know that there's going to be a mixed audience there. Uh, verse 4, and P.S., as we're going through this, I'm just rambling stream of thought here. If you've got a question, if you've got something to add, please interrupt me because it's, please, please interrupt me, okay? Verse 4, I, yes, go. Well done, sir. Sosthenes, uh, we see Sosthenes also mentioned in Acts chapter 18 again. Uh, let me get back there. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. So that would mean he is a local. Uh, verse 17, then the crowd turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. This is the guy who brought the charges against Paul. 
and got beaten to a pulp. And now what's he doing? <laughs> He's working with Paul, isn't he? Fascinating. Good question. Yes. Secretary would be, yeah, the, the Greek term for that is an emanuensis. Um, how much does it cost to send an email? Almost nothing, right? How much does it cost to send a text message? We don't, we don't do the pay by text anymore, do we? I remember arguing with the cell phone company to no end of like, well, we'll, you know, we'll move you up this package and it you know, gives you unlimited text messages. I'm like, I don't want to send text messages. That's how everybody communicates. Not me. <laughs> I'm not going to pay for that. Okay, sorry. I'm stuck in the mud. It, it doesn't cost us much. I mean, the most expensive thing we can do is probably send an overnight letter, and yet I'm pretty sure everybody in the room could send an overnight letter if we had to, right? Okay? What if sending a letter cost you as much as your car or more? Again, our, our world has changed a bit. And where it meant that there was no postal service, you're not just going to hand this off to somebody. Somebody's going to have to travel with this. And so now you've got to pay for their travel and their fare and their room and their board and all the things. And, and pray that they have safety on the way because, you know, they're going out in the middle of nowhere. And Anybody know how many times Paul was shipwrecked off the top of your head? <laughs> how many times have any of you been shipwrecked? Okay, world has changed a bit, all right? So uh, the cost to send a letter is incredibly expensive. The stuff to write it on, whether it be on, on uh, vellum or whatever medium they're writing it on, that can be very expensive. So you want to do it right. And what typically you would do is uh, Paul, Paul grew up in a world where he was probably speaking at least four different languages. Um, as, a, as a Jew, he would have known Hebrew, his common everyday language would have been Aramaic, uh, the official language of, you know, the, most of the world at that point was Greek because Alexander the Great had come and Greekized everything, but the Roman Empire didn't necessarily speak Greek, what did they speak? Latin. So Paul's going to be probably conversant in four different languages, at least. But what's he speaking most? Hebrew Aramaic, Right? So if I'm writing to a Greek audience, a place that I spent time, a place that I could communicate, but I'm not as familiar with all those cultural idioms, might I not waste the ink and the effort and make sure that it's clear by having somebody who's from there write it? Yeah. We do get, um, I think it's in Romans. I have to do that off the top of my head. In one of Paul's letters, the amanuensis, the secretary, chimes in and says, I, who am writing this down, greet you as well. And so it was a well-known technique to writing things. So, yeah, very well. He could have been working with him. He could have just simply been the penman. Um, but, yeah, it's, again, it's a team effort. Paul, Paul's not in his basement on his laptop at midnight just typing this and shooting it to somebody. Verse 4, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech, and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among y'all. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await uh, for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And again, those are, we, we don't, hmm, we don't think of the word Lord as being a huge, major thing. In our world, when you hear Lord, who do you think of? Jesus. You might think of British, British nobility, lords and ladies, that kind of thing. What if, what if, I'm going to try to make this as non-political as humanly possible. Canada invades us tomorrow. They drown us all in maple syrup and threaten to 
I, I don't know. Whatever Canadians do, right? Cover us in maple leaves. So we surrender. We're now all Canadians. And the prime minister, the prime minister expects us to call him Lord, Savior, because he's the only one who can make the maple syrup go away. And of course, because God put Canada on top of us, they are our crown to the north. And therefore, he wears the crown. Therefore, he is a god. And he is the son of the gods who put him in that position. Therefore, you call him Lord and Savior and Son of God. <laughs> I'll just be done right now, right? That's the world that Paul's writing to. That's it. The one who runs everything and controls everything and pays the salaries of the guys standing on the corner with, you know, assault swords, like they're ready to go. The money you carry does not say in God we trust. It says Caesar is Lord. You flip over your coin and there's a picture of Caesar and he's like holding the universe. He is the God that sustains everything, the world as you know it. So he claims the official position of the empire. You want to go against the empire? So again, all this greeting stuff that we're just like, yeah, of course, Jesus. What if this letter falls in the wrong hands between Paul, wherever he is writing this, and Corinth? It's a risky thing to pull off. In addition to that, his Jewish brothers and sisters know the word Lord, who does it refer to? Yahweh, the God of Israel, all the way through the Old Testament. And now, who is Paul calling Lord? God and Jesus. He's referring to one God and two. We're getting into that Trinity stuff there, where the same thing can be said about God, the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, yet they also have distinct elements too. I don't want to wade too deep into Trinitarian theology today. I, I want us to leave with a smile on our face, not a headache in our brains. But we will cover it as we need to. Look at verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind, and NIV says thought. Probably a little bit better translation there would be in mind and purpose, or mind and mission. Uh, the idea there is that we are unified. Verse 11, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Okay, be honest. What are your thoughts on that? Cephas, Peter. Cephas would be Peter. Yep, absolutely. They should all be saying they follow Christ. Mm -hmm. Those individuals are bringing Christ's message, right? Yes, sir. It is the problem he's addressing. Remember, our, remember how Paul does this. He'll mention the problem, then he's going to bring the gospel in, he's going to talk about what the gospel means for us, and then we're going to start applying it to different areas of our life after that. So the problem here is, it's, it's division. You've got people going, why follow Paul? Why follow Apollos? Why follow Cephas? Who was, who was Paul? It's the guy writing the letter, or at least co-writing the letter, right? Who's Apollos? P.S. It's not the Greek God. But he's named after the Greek God. Let that soak in for a minute. He's a missionary. Where do we see him else? 
Priscilla and Aquila. Remember, Priscilla and Aquila are working with Paul, and they meet where? We just read it earlier. In, in Corinth there. They're together in Corinth. Now, later you get this little subset of uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and they hear a preaching, a sermon from a guy named Apollos. But Apollos doesn't know the whole story of Jesus. Yeah, he, he knows about John. He knows about John's baptism, but they go, well, let us fill you in on the rest of this. And so Apollos then learns the rest of the gospel message, and then now from there he goes on and he does stuff. Uh, random side note, a lot of people think maybe Apollos was the one who wrote Hebrews. We don't know. Just going to throw that out there, though. That's, that's a somewhat common theory. So you've got these different groups that are all coming in and preaching about Christ, but they're all coming in with different ways and different methods and different techniques and personalities. Yeah, Eddie. Mm. We, we have division today, don't we? Yeah. Um, I, I had a, uh, a family member one time go, well, I could never go to a fill-in-the-blank church. And I went, do they worship Jesus? Yeah. Do they use the Bible? Yeah. And you, you couldn't even assemble long enough to <laughs> greet them in the name of Jesus? Well, uh, uh, we may not be I follow Paul, I follow Cephas, I follow Apollos, but we divide over a whole number of ideas, don't we? Uh, again, denominational distinctives, right? And, and so... Um, what if, well, let's take Cephas, Peter. Are there any differences between Peter and Paul in, in the way that they present the gospel? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a big difference at first, right? Um, because you get in the early chapters of Acts and you've got, like, Paul's already out going out and doing the Gentile thing, and Peter's like, you know what's wrong for me to walk in here, right? <laughs> Now, God gets a hold of both of them. And by the time you get to Acts 15, they're both arguing in favor of, hey, let's let the Gentiles in. Like, God's already doing it. Why are we going to argue against it? But they do have their distinctives in ways that they talk about things. So, my, I like the way that Peter phrases this better than Paul. Might I like the way that this theologian puts it better than this theologian? And now we've got denominational divisions. What about the way that Paul speaks and the way that he paraphrases the story of Jesus versus the way that Apollos paraphrases the story of Jesus? And now we've got different translations, right? You, you see, the same things that we're dealing with today in a lot of ways are the, the same things up there. A little church history, by the way. You are at Countryside Christian Church, a non-denominational Christian church. Do you know how that movement got started? It was actually an effort at church unity because um, there were some Presbyterians and there were some Methodists and there were some Baptists uh, that all got together to do something that was like, you know, really taboo, uh, worship and take the Lord's Supper together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a place called Cane Ridge. Uh, and this caused some, some problems. And so a lot of the denominations were going, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. And so the solution was, let's form a new denomination. That lasted about a year, and then they went, why did we just form what we <laughs> tried to unform? So there's a really interesting document. You can just Google it and find it. It's the last, it's the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. The last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. Go read it. Just Google it. You'll find it in PDF or typed in blogs or whatever. It's interesting to read because they kept saying, you know what? We, we came together out of a sense of unity and we realized by coming together this way, well, all we've done is created another division. So we will that we just kind of melt into the body of Christ <laughs> and that everybody just kind of melts their own identities into the body of Christ and that we just become one.
Yeah. He, he was, he was um, yeah, he was uh, excommunicated or uh, exiled. That's what I'm looking for. Exiled out to the, you know, the vast wilderness of Pennsylvania and Ohio. From Scotland out to the wild frontier. This trouble causer. And then he just kept, you know, worshiping with the wrong kinds of people. And what did Jesus get in trouble for? Worshiping with the wrong kinds of people. Hmm. Yeah been a problem all along. Uh, let's finish this paragraph and then we'll be done. Verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can boast that, you know, hey, I baptized you. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I also baptized um, Stephanus and beyond that, man, I really don't remember who I baptized because, you know, really, Christ didn't send me to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So people were kind of joining cliques over who baptized them and what and who speaks better because Paul's going, I'm I'm not coming with wisdom and eloquence. I know that's attractive for some people. That's not why I'm here. I'm here simply to point you to Christ. So what's the message and what's the mission of all Christians? Point people to Christ. Point people to Christ. Now, from here, what Paul's going to do is he's going to start talking about the gospel and why it is foolish to start dividing and causing divisions within the body the way that they're doing. Then we're going to wrestle with that a little bit in our own body afterwards. May God bless you. We are done a little bit early and right on time, Dalton. Hey, buddy. All right, so we're going to let the worship team go ahead and get going. Stick around for a little bit of fellowship, visit, and we will join back in 1 Corinthians next week, God willing.